Our speaker tonight is Jessie Mon, is a statewide technician for extension. She has background in forestry and entomology and works with the public to solve their pest problems using, and I don't have my note, so, uh, but here she is, thanks. Let me know if you can't hear me. I'm not really used to uh, microphones or crowds this large. Um, so thanks for having me to this, the Science Pub um, board and organizers. I really appreciate it. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, so like, like um, was mentioned, my name is Jesse. I work for Cooperative Extension. I'm the statewide integrated pest management technician. So I do a lot or a little bit of a lot of different things. Um, one of my biggest responsibilities is I do insect and disease identifications of various plants and I work with homeowners to solve um, their tree pest issues or tree disease issues. Um, so a lot of people bring me things for identification and I get to go out and help people solve their problems. So if you have a pest problem and it's burning and you're just like, how do I fix this? You can give us a call and we can uh, try, and, try and work out what's going on. So I'm going to talk about the insects of Alaska today. My background um, is in forestry and entomology, so we're going to talk uh, about some insects that you would see in the forest more than um, more than the other insects. And hopefully, a lot of the the questions from the quiz will come up, and you'll be like, "Oh, I got that one right." Um, so I, I thought this was a pretty fitting slide to start with for um, for this evening's discussion of the aphids on the hops, thinking, I'm going to get into craft brewing because that's what all the cool kids are doing, right? <laughs> so, um, so we're going to talk about the insects of Alaska. Uh, this, this presentation, my being here, is brought to you by several different people. Um, like I said, I work for Extension, but we partner heavily with the U.S. Forest Service um, and the USDA APHIS, as well as the Alaska um, Department of Natural Resources. So I thought first that um, we would kind of go through some basics, like a general refresher of what makes an insect an insect. Um, so one of those things is uh, there's this ratio that I love, and it's three to six, which is not in the right order up here because things never work out that way. But um, so what makes an insect an insect is that an insect has three different body regions. Ta-da! That would be the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So I like these are these are our entomology, our scientific terms. Um, so if something needs explaining and I gloss over it, by all means, just interrupt me. That's great. Um, another thing that makes insects insects is that they have six legs. They only have six legs. They'll always have six legs unless they got ripped off or who knows what. Insects have six legs. Uh, and they have two antennae. There are... Uh, occasionally, insects will have between two and four wings. Um, wings in, uh, in insects are very specific. There are no other invertebrates that have wings, but flight is not something that makes an insect an insect. So having wings is not what makes it an insect. Um, so. Yeah. And there's my wings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what are, what are some of the, the, the general numbers of insects that we have in the world? This is not specific to Alaska. Um, there are about one million described species. And so what I mean by that is that this is an insect that has been collected. Someone has taken a lot of time to describe all of its general state of being in terms of its size, the, the number of you know, hairs it has in certain parts of the body. I mean, great, great detail. Um, they've described it and they've given it a scientific name. So that's what I mean by described species. Um, a lot of people estimate that there is upwards of 10 million species of insects. So there's about 90% of them that we don't know about. They don't have names. They've never been found, something like that. So there's a lot of species out there. About 40% of our described species are beetles. I have an asterisk here because there's a lot of work being done with the flies these days. And so um, 
a lot of people think that the flies are going to eventually surpass the beetles in their number of, of described species and just their general abundance in the world. And one thing that I really love to um, remind people of is that less than 1% of all of the insects out there are actually pests. So 99% of things want nothing to do with you and want to do you no harm, I assure you. They're just trying to live their life and do what they want. Yeah? It's a great question. Um, so usually when I talk to people about pests, it, uh, what makes a pest to you? So a pest is something that is either causing you harm, it's annoying in some way, it is uh, doing something that affects you know, livelihood or comfort or something like that. So that's generally, there's no scientific because what, what's a pest to some person is not a pest to another person. So when I say less than 1% of species are pests, that's 1% of species could potentially do something that would be annoying or eat your crops or whatever. So that's, there's a whole lot of other things that are, you don't even notice in your daily life. So what about the Alaska insects? I've put some of our higher level taxonomy, so that's how we classify different animals um, up here. So insects are in the animal kingdom. They're in the, uh, they're grouped together with the other arthropods, so that's our crabs, our lobsters, our spiders, centipedes, millipedes, all that stuff. They're in their very own class, so they're in the insecta. Um, and there's about, in Alaska, about 24 different orders of insects. And when I say order, I'm talking about things like the, the bigger groups of beetles or flies um, or butterflies, things like that. Uh, there's like 32 to 35 orders of insects in the world, depending on who you ask and what day it is. Um, but in Alaska, we have about 24. Um, within, within the orders, we have about 450 families of insects, approximately 3,000 genera, and about 10,500 species. Again, these are all approximate numbers because as we learn more about insects, as we as more people go out and collect, as more things are found, these numbers change. Also, names change. So, um, so sometimes these, what we thought was its own species actually ends up being the same as another species. So these numbers are kind of always in flux. Um, one of the reasons why that's important is that even um, even for the most studied species, we have a lot of insects in Alaska that we don't know about, but we have a lot that have been very well studied and very well researched. Um, so even for those, we still know very little about most of the species. We, we know very little about their biology, about their distribution, um, and about their life cycle and habitats. So um, it's a really good opportunity for professionals and amateurs to um, contribute to what our knowledge of entomology is. And I bring that up because one of the things that I'm going to go through when I talk about different insects is um, the, the wide variety of citizen science projects that are out there um, for people to participate in through either taking photographs or submitting sightings of different things. So ways that everyone can be engaged in learning more about the insect fauna of Alaska. So, if you all were paying attention, um, the four-spotted skimmer has, is something that has come up before because this is, any guesses? A state insect. It is not the mosquito, um, as, as uh, most people think it is, but the, it's this dragonfly. Um, this was voted on by school kids in the mid-90s, and they decided that um, they wanted this dragonfly because it's prettier, it does good things like eat mosquitoes, um, rather than having the state insect to be something that we always, you know, equate to something that is a pest that's bothering us, things like that. So, four spotted skimmer is our state insect. If you see one, thank it for its service. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things in, um, about dragonflies is that there's a couple of dragonflies that are actually migratory. So, we usually think about things that migrate, like birds and stuff like that, but we actually have some migratory dragonflies. Um, there's a couple, there's a project out there called the Migratory Dragonfly Partnership, um, and they're actually looking at trying to see where all these migratory dragonflies show up throughout, you know, seasons. Um, and dragonflies are actually one of the groups of insects that has been really well studied in Alaska. There's a really great guidebook. 
this is actually the first version of it. There's a second, newer edition. Um, it's hardbound on the side. It's called Dragonflies of Alaska, but it's got really great pictures in it, and it shows, um, tells all about biology, where you find it, things like that, and it's a really great ID, um, a source for identification of dragonflies, so if you're interested, this is a good one. The, um, the two... Um, Migratory dragonflies that occasionally show up in Alaska are the common wing, uh, common green darner, the spot wing glider. So both of those are in this book, um, so you can read about them, learn about them, and hopefully if you have access to a wetland or a stream or something like that, go out and try and observe dragonflies, see if you can catch any of these or you know, observe any of these migratory dragonflies. Yeah. Good question, that's what they're trying to find out. So the, the thinking for um, Alaska would be they're, they're coming in from Canada or the Pacific Northwest um, in some regard. But yeah, so they, they don't know. <laughs> so they're trying to find out. Okay, so we're gonna talk about mosquitoes. Um, this is not one of my favorite things to talk about, I'll be really honest with you guys. Um, mosquitoes are just kind of a fact of life. They are extremely annoying. They are like the worst, right? They're the kind of thing that you're outside, you know, if you spend a lot of time outside in the summertime, um, there's a point in time, at least for me, where I think uh, I'm going to end up as a headline in the news of local woman literally goes insane in a swarm of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, so they are a fact of life; they just happen. Um, but they there are there are some some benefits to mosquitoes, and we'll talk about those. Um, I think it's interesting. Mosquitoes are such a big deal, and they have been such a big deal for so long that when the first review of mosquitoes was published for the state of Alaska in the '60s. Um, they actually talked about the economic importance of mosquitoes, and, and this little gem was in there. Um, they were concerned about mosquitoes really being an economic deterrent in the state and, and hindering the progress and success of the state of Alaska. So um, insects have always been a nuisance. They've always been uh, uh, tough for people, but, but we still have them. We cannot eradicate them. Um, they are, they're native here, and, and they just... We have to learn to accept them. So one of the one of the benefits of mosquitoes are there's there's several benefits of them. It's the cold hard truth. They can't just all be bad. Um, is that in Alaska mosquitoes don't vector human pathogens. And I say yet because um, it's possible that they could, but so far we've been pretty lucky in that our mosquitoes aren't aren't carrying diseases yet. Um, mosquitoes are really important sources of food for other animals. So they, um, you know, there's birds, there's bats, frogs, all that good stuff that eat mosquitoes, and then fish also eat a lot of mosquitoes. And surprisingly enough, um, mosquitoes can be really important pollinators. Uh, the, the males only feed on plant nectar, um, so they're, they're the ones that are in the flowers um, transferring pollen. Whereas the females are the only the, um, the only ones that take a blood. And I feel like as an entomologist, you almost can't do a presentation of any kind without using a far side comic because Gary Larson uh, did so many about insects. Um, so this is one of uh, our Alaska mosquitoes. Um, so there are 27 species of mosquitoes in Alaska. So I believe that was C you know, on the first question. Again, this is one of those things that, depending on who you ask, that number can be a little bit different, but it is most commonly believed and most widely thought to be um, about 27 species. Um, that in, that's from about four different genera, so it's a pretty broad group. Um, mosquitoes themselves are their own family. Most of them are feeding on some sort of blood, whether that's, they'll also feed on um, birds and pigeons. Um, but in their, um, in their immature stage, they're all aquatic. So that's the one thing that ties all mosquitoes together is that they, they have an aquatic life stage. Um, 
you see here, this is the, the larval form. These guys are actually breathing right now. They don't normally hang out like that, but in order to breathe, they have to take oxygen from the air, and so they have a tube that comes out of their abdomen, and they exchange gases, and it's a magical process. Um, but they do spend a good uh, majority of their time in the water, which is why they're such a great source of food for fish and things like that. They also pupate in the water, so that's a life, um, part of the life cycle, which is a whole other presentation for another day. I don't know that we have time for that today. Um, so mosquitoes are good guys some of the time. Yeah. How, how long is one of those? Oh, yeah. So depending on the species, they're about an eighth of an inch long. Um, they're not huge. They do tend to cluster, so you can find big groups of them, and it looks like a weird floating blob. But uh, they're not big. They're just kind of wiggly little little guys. <coughs> so this is our Alaska snow mosquito, which is not uh, the state insect. Um, mosquitoes can be out at different times of year, so they each have each species has their own kind of life cycle. We have early mosquitoes. These these are the snow mosquitoes are our early season mosquitoes. So they're the ones that come out first, and they're the ones that remind us that spring is on its way or summer's on its way, and that all is right with the world. Um, and then each different species will start to emerge at different times um, throughout the throughout the summer, um, and then they kind of die off. So it's not always the same ones that's causing us causing us problems, but it's all of them. Uh, so I couldn't find a citizen science project for mosquitoes, which I, I feel like um, makes me feel good as a human being. <laughs> that no one is out there being like, yes, go feed the mosquitoes or something like that. So sorry, there's no giant uh, nationwide effort to collect species or anything like that. Though if someone wants to start one, I guess this would be a good niche to fill. So the next group is the bumblebees. Um, I think that bumblebees are interesting. Bumblebees in Alaska are um, kind of extra interesting because they um, fill a, a, a need in pollination. So bumblebees typically exist in places where other pollinators don't exist. Um, so while we have a lot of bees, different types of bees in Alaska, um, our bumblebees are probably one of our, our most common and most um, useful bees. There are um, about 24 species of bumblebees in Alaska. And there's a really great color guide to identification of them, which I'll show a little bit later. But um, bumblebees have really hairy bodies. So you can see here, they're super covered in hair. The hair is usually arranged in different bands, and this is, this is a type of coloration that um, is used as a warning to potential predators. So um, the, the yellow and black that kind of mimics the hum honeybee, potential predators see this and they think, I don't want to eat that, you know, I, I want nothing to do with that, it's going to bite me, it's going to sting me, um, things like that. So they have this very distinct coloration to them. Um, and we, we actually call that aposemitic coloration if you're looking for really great terms to use in general conversation. <coughs> Um, so this is another one of our native bumblebees. Um, bumblebees do really well in cold temperatures because they can do a variety of things, which um, I think was alluded to in one of the, one of the questions. Um, one of the things that bumblebees will do is that they can actually absorb heat from the sun. So even if it's too cold outside, they're, they're sitting in a warm, sunny place, they can absorb that heat enough to get their flight muscles warm enough to fly. Um, another thing that they can do is they can shiver. So they will, like everything, you know, burn, they shiver. So they're actually um, moving their muscles. It's creating energy within their body. And then that is enough to make their flight muscles, you know, get their wings to go and all that stuff. Um, and then another way is they can actually segment off different, you know, we talked about they have three different body regions. They can segment, segment off those different body regions to concentrate heat in specific parts of the body. So in this case, they're concentrating it in their thorax because that's where the legs and the wings are. Um, so they can actually concentrate the heat so they have plenty of energy um, and warmth to move their muscles to actually fly. So that's one of the ways that they can kind of, they, they excel at higher latitudes and higher altitudes than any of our other um, 
other bees. There are some tropical bumblebees, but by far most of the species of bees exist in um, cooler climates. They also are super hairy, right? So that provides a lot of insulation. Bumblebees are great pollinators, um, and because of their, their hairy bodies, they go into flowers that that pollen gets stuck in the hair, they go to another flower, they transfer it, all that good stuff. They're also collecting pollen to take back to their hive. That's what they feed their young. And what they do is, if, if they're not transferring this pollen to another flower, then they'll actually perch or land somewhere and they'll groom the pollen out of their hair. And then they store it in these little um, pollen baskets on their hind legs, which is this yellow blob that you see coming off the back there. It's actually a, a big store of pollen. Um, and then they, they carry that back to the nest and they either use it to um, feed young or they'll put it in the top of a, an egg cell so that when that, that egg hatches, they have food. And this is what a bumblebee nest looks like. Uh, if you want to see one dried, I have a specimen over here. But essentially, so honeybees, you know, we think of these gigantic colonies. They have tens of thousands of individuals in them. Um, bumblebees usually have between 50 and 400 and they're laying these really um, much less neat and tidy, um, or making these much less neat and tidy nests in loose soil and in dense vegetation right at the ground level, things like that. But it's essentially these little balls of wax that the queen creates, and she lays an egg in there, and then she puts this mixture of pollen and spit and all kinds of stuff right on top so that the, the newly hatched immature has something to eat when it comes out. Um, these nests are all annual, so they're not like honeybees in that they have a continual nest. They actually, all of these, all of the individuals except for the queen dies in the fall, and then the queen will overwinter and under bark or in a protected place, something like that, and she'll make an entirely new nest the following spring. So. Um, bumblebees, by the way, all females, bumblebees can sting, um, but they don't have a barbed stinger like honeybees do, so they can sting you repeatedly. Um, however, they're, they're not aggressive towards humans at all. You really have to kind of get in there and agitate a bumblebee to, uh, or surprise it in some way to get stung by one. So a few years ago, a graduate student up at UAF um, did a, a bunch of collecting of bumblebees and created this guide to bumblebee coloration and how to identify different species of them, which is a really easy, great guide to use. Um, I can, if you're interested, I'd be happy to send you the publication that has this in there. But it's uh, so these are all the different species of bumblebees in Alaska, and you can kind of just go through and tell them by you know how many yellow segments versus black segments segments they have, um, and it's proven to be pretty effective. So there's a cool product out there called Bumblebee Watch. <clears throat> and this is uh, essentially you go out, you take a photo of a bumblebee, you log in, you submit your photo. Um, there we go. Um, you can identify it, and then that identification is verified by an expert. So someone else, they have this uh, you know, great network of folks that, folks that will come in and actually identify or verify your identification. And then and then it gets plotted on a map, and you can go in and, and um, click on the different points, and it'll tell you who who submitted it, who verified it, all that good stuff. And so this is the data we have on bumblebees in Alaska so far. Um, there's a lot more that we can fill in there. So, um, and so I would encourage you all to go out and do that if you're interested in such things. But, uh, but yeah, it just goes to show there are people out there doing that here. and. Um, and so we have, we have some information, but we will love it. All right, so the next one is the spruce beetle. Uh, true to life. No, they're not that big, I promise. Um, so the spruce beetle can be a pretty devastating pest in Alaska. If you've been in Alaska for a while, you probably remember the outbreaks on the Kenai Peninsula in the 90s. It was just um, very, very damaging. If you're new to Alaska, the, the spruce beetle is um, like a sibling pest or sibling species to the mountain pine beetle, which is wreaking havoc in uh, the western United States right now. 
So this is the, this is just the range of spruce beetle in the in I guess on North America. See, so it ranges east to west, and then can be found farther as far south as like Arizona and things like that. Um, but it's pretty bad, or can be pretty bad up here in Alaska. And so this is this is what happens. Um, this is I'm not sure that the color on that is um, I don't know how it looks back there, but. Uh, what you might be seeing is more gray than red, but a lot of these spikes. Oh yeah. So a lot of these right here, these are spruce trees. They're red. If they don't look red, just pretend. <laughs> They're supposed to be red. Um, they should be red, and that that's a dead spruce tree. So spruce trees, spruce, spruce trees aren't supposed to be red. They should be nice, green, healthy. But this is just an example of. Or this is this is from the outbreaks in the 90s of the extent of damage that spruce beetle can do. Um, spruce beetle likes older, um, larger spruce trees, and it has just come in and and really wiped out most of those older trees. There's a little patch down in the bottom um, of younger trees that aren't yet quite dead, but who knows? <laughs> um, I also like this picture because you can clearly see on my computer screen. Um, the red versus green of the, the dead spruce trees and then the, the green living hardwood trees. So how does spruce, how does spruce beetle kill trees? Um, so essentially what a spruce beetle is doing is if you think about a piece of wood or a tree, you've got the bark on the outside and you've got the, the wood on the inside. In between the bark and the wood there's a, a layer of tissue that's actually taking nutrients up and down the tree and that's where the bark beetles are feeding. So they are disrupting all of that tissue and essentially starving the tree. Um, the picture on the left here, that's, that's the damage. We call those galleries. So they're actually feeding and they're, they're removing some of this tissue and creating these, um, these like little networks underneath the bark. And what that does is, if that happens all, all the way around the tree, it kills the tree. So that's how that happens. Um, in the the right on top, that's um, that's the pitch from the tree. So when the beetle initiates an attack, it creates a little hole, and the tree's response is to try and push that beetle out. So they create pitch, they create sap, and they try and push that beetle out that hole. Um, one of the things that you can see with with spruce beetle is that as they're kind of excavating and pulling stuff out, they create this reddish brown sawdust, which is the bottom picture, and that accumulates in the um, uh, around the, the loose bark and at the base of the tree. So if you see that in a tree, it might have some sort of wood boring beetle, maybe spruce beetle. So there's a lot of different bark beetles out there. Spruce beetle is considered a bark beetle. Um, and one of the interesting things about different bark beetles is that all, a lot of times you can tell them apart based solely on um, the structure of their galleries. So on the left we have spruce beetle, on the right we have um, a different type of beetle in a different genus. And you can see that they have very different types of galleries. Spruce beetles are really like, willy-nilly all over the place. And the, the guy on the right is a much neater, cleaner, they just go straight out and they're done. So how does spruce beetle kind of survive our cold, extreme climates? Um, because it does have this huge geographic distribution. Um, it can have, spruce beetle can have a one to three year life cycle. Um, in Alaska, it's almost always a two year life cycle. And that kind of helps it um, go through its entire developmental process and reach adulthood successfully. So it takes them two years to fully become adults from the eighth stage. And this just kind of goes through how that happens. Um, so initially, you know, um, they bore into the tree, they kind of create this, go back here, um, you can kind of see there's like a vertical part of this gallery that goes up and down, so that's bored out, and then the female will lay eggs on both sides of that gallery, and then when those eggs hatch, then the larvae feed out, that's how that happens. So, so they'll, they'll lay these eggs in the spring, those larvae will feed, and then they overwinter in that immature, this grub-like stage here down on the bottom right. And then the next spring, 
they come out, they feed a little bit more, and then they pupate. So that's the big change. That's the like a butterfly going from a caterpillar to the, the pretty butterfly in the cocoon. So that's the, the pupation. So they pupate, and then the, and then you have an adult. But that adult is like, I'm not ready to face the world. And so they will either leave the tree and reattack farther down, but they'll essentially overwinter again in the adult stage before they decide to go out and mate and lay eggs and do all that stuff. So they overwinter twice, um, and then they're ready to really be active and engaged and <laughs> do some damage. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how bark beetles survive our, our cold temperatures. So how can you observe bark beetles? Well, hopefully um, it's not because you have a tree in your yard that's dying or anything like that. But there's actually a really cool project, and I, I love this project. Um, it's called the Backyard Bark Beetle Project, and you can actually go out and trap bark beetles with a really simple homemade trap. You collect them from the trap, and you put them in an envelope, and you ship them off to someone else to identify. And then they put, again, put your point on the map, they put your information up there, and you can go in and you can view di different data from different places and things like that. Um, I like it because this trap is super simple. So essentially all you need is a two liter soda bottle, you cut a big window in the side of it, you squirt some hand sanit alcohol-based hand sanitizer in there, and what that's doing is um, bark beetles are, are actually attracted to um, the ethanol, so when a tree is stressed or injured in some way, it's creating different chemicals, and so the alcohol and the hand sanitizer is actually attracting them to that trap, and it also serves to, when the beetles fly in, the, the hand sanitizer kills the beetles, and it also preserves them. So it's, it's three multi-use, perfect, perfect tool for this. Um, so you hang this guy up in, in your yard or in the woods next to your yard or whatever. You go in, you scoop out whatever, gets caught in there, put them in a Ziploc, ship them off to, um, for the Western United States, it's Michigan Tech. They identify them and they put your information up on the web. And researchers nationwide have a lot more information about bark beetles. So um, if you're so inclined, this is a great one to participate in too. And with that, I'm at 30 minutes and 30 seconds, so I will entertain any additional questions or we can proceed with the, the trivia or whatever happens next. So or just beforehand, I brought some um, bug cases, some physical specimens. They don't really project very well to an audience, but uh, I'll hang out and we can talk about cool insects. So. so. Any questions? Yeah? Are bees venomous? So the question was, are bees venomous? Um, so it's an interesting question. So when we think of venom, it comes usually comes from something being injected. But what's happening with bees is that it's an allergic reaction, and so not everyone reacts the same. So um, venomous and poisonous kind of maybe aren't the the best terms to use to describe it. It's more of a, it, it's so dependent on the actual person. It's kind of the same with mosquitoes, like not everyone reacts to a mosquito bite the same way. Um, and so I would say more that they have, um, they're, you know, you have an allergic reaction to it, but I wouldn't call them venomous. They're not biting or injecting anything, it's just their stinger. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, what exactly is it that they're reacting to? Is it just the presence of that little tissue, or is it, is there something, is there a surface sample that's getting pressure? So I should say I'm not a bee specialist. <laughs> I am a forest entomologist mostly. Um, so my understanding is that it is like a surface chemical, and especially with honeybees, was there um, but because they have the barb stinger and it stays in, like that's what's creating a problem, even though wasps and <coughs> bumblebees can sting as well. So, is anybody? Yeah. Um, what methods are there to manage the bark beetle problem, and do you think any of those have any hope of working? So the question was, what methods do we have to manage bark beetles, and do they work, essentially? 
So on a forest scale, um, there are management practices that are really great for, for reducing your risk for bark beetles. Um, bark beetles are a native pest. They are always out there. Even when they're not in outbreak conditions, bark beetles are still out there doing their thing. Um, so one of the things that is stressed with people is um, you know, healthy forests make resilient forests that are less resistant to bark beetle attacks. So some things are outside of our control, weather's outside of our control, um, can't, you know, can't predict, or we can't change how much it rains, but um, a well, if you have a, a big tract of land, um, a forest that you're managing, a well-managed forest, a less dense forest, so bark beetles like really dense spruce stands, um, that's a good management um, tool to use for bark beetles. Um, and it just depends on if you're talking about, you know, let's say a national forest versus someone's 40 acres and things like that. But there are some that work really well. They're, um, again, it's not one of those things that you can really eradicate from a place because they're a native pest, but um, there are some things that you can do, for sure. Yeah? So I read an article about um, some scientists were developing a way to genetically alter female mosquitoes so that their offspring are infertile to essentially wipe out populations of mosquitoes within several generations. Do you know anything about that? Have we thought about that for Alaska? I don't. I, I know I know that there are a lot of pro, uh, programs to do things like irradiation and stuff like that, but I don't know I don't know enough about them <laughs> to comment and I haven't heard that anyone's trying that for Alaska. Would you think it would be a good idea or a bad idea? So, um, that's a great question. Uh, from from my perspective, I feel like it's it's maybe you know kind of getting into too much of messing with the ecology of an area. So, you know, we have to think about what happens if we eradicate all of the mosquitoes. Like, what does that do to the food chain as a whole? So that's where I think. Um, I would personally start in trying to decide if I thought it was a good or bad idea. But I think it's an interesting topic and I think it's an interesting thing to explore, but um, I'm not sure yet how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah? Well, just as a side note, I think with the mosquito thing, they're more targeting that in areas where the zoonotic diseases are more of an issue before people die from the malaria. So they did have mosquitoes in the right. My question for you was, do you happen to know anything about Alaska's native sex? No, and that's one that um, comes up on occasion is that there are, yeah, sorry, so you asked about the native burying beetles, right? So there's the American burying beetle, which is, um, was or currently is considered an, in an endangered species. It's kind of, you know, being lost in a lot of landscapes across the, across the country. Um, we do have burying beetles in Alaska. I don't think that they're threatened at this point in time, population-wise. Um, I think they have plenty of food sources and not a lot of things that are pressuring, you know, uh, mortality pressures on them. So I don't know if anyone who's actually studying that, though. So if you're looking for something to do in the future, <laughs> I think it's a great question because we see this what's happening, especially in the east on the east coast. Um, and I think it would be interesting to know what's going on in Alaska as well. That's why, you know, I had that uh, quote up there from. Um, the author of another great book if you're interested in insects, which is the Insects of South Central Alaska, who said that, you know, professional and amateur entomologists have a great opportunity to increase our knowledge, so there's a lot of things that we still don't know. Yeah. Are the bark beetles surviving on the nutrients that are running up and down the tree, or just the wood? So it's a great question. Um, so they are actually, so they're they're feeding in this the tissue. So it's this vascular tissue, and I don't know how much how much sustenance they're deriving from what's go, you know, the water and nutrients going up and down the tree versus how much they're deriving from the actual part that they're removing. Um, when the tree dies, what happens to the pupa and the water? So if you say if you have a, a tree that has spruce beetle in it and you cut down the tree so they will they will live in there for some period of time they'll go through their life cycle we recommend part of the control strategy would be if that happens to if you can strip all the bark off of your 
trees because that'll dry them out and desiccate them. Um, uh, they can complete their life cycle that way. Um, usually if they, when they would emerge as adults and stay in the tree or reinfest uh, lower, they would go to the next closest tree if that tree was downed, if you have it split up for firewood, something like that. So they can complete their life cycle in a recently felled tree, if that addresses the question. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering, I don't know if you know this, but I noticed APHIS up there. Is there currently, I'm from the East Coast, and I know with Asian longhorn, there's all sorts of different regulations, how, how small you have to chip your tree stuff like that. Is there currently a management program like that for beetles? No, because they're a native pest. So oh, right. with, with Asian longhorn beetle, that all those APHIS regulations come because it's a, it's a regulated invasive species, yeah. So we don't have things like that um, for species beetle in Alaska. I have a two-part question. Tristan, um, you said that So the questions were, what are my favorite things to talk about, and what's the biggest threat to forests in Alaska? Yeah, so um, the biggest threats I see are invasive species. So it's these things that could come in and do widespread damage because they don't have um, net natural enemies to, um, you know, help keep their populations under control, um, which would actually then be my favorite thing to talk about, is invasive species. So, um, you know, the whole burn your firewood where you buy it, things like that, um, invasive species could do a lot in Alaska because while they're doing a lot down in the lower 48, we have less diversity in our forests in Alaska. So um, some of, you know, central hardwoods, there's a lot of species, not that things aren't doing a lot of damage down there, but um, the, the eastern hardwood mixed conifer forests, there's a lot of different species out there. We have far fewer species of trees in Alaska, so if something was to wipe out all of our birch trees, for example, that's a huge gap in our forest. Um, that there's fewer things to replace it, stand-wise, ecology-wise, things like that. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about your work and what kind of projects you're working on right now. Sure. A little bit more about my work and what kind of projects. Um, so as summer approaches, then we're getting ready to start our trapping season. So we're gonna be trapping for invasive moths. So if you see little green triangle traps hanging in trees around town, um, I put those up, so. Uh, <laughs> don't take them. Don't take them down, yes, please. Um, uh, we're also gonna be doing some, um, with other partners, are gonna be doing some um, wood boring and bark beetle trapping um, around the state. Um, the, the moth trapping happens around the state. There's several people that are involved in it. So we're going to be trapping for some invasive species. Um, we're doing general calls with folks about, um, in my, what I'm doing is people say, oh, my tree is looking ill, my tree has, I think I have something, you know, in my tree, so I will consult with them on what's going on and how to best um, fix the problem or, you know, what their, what their options are for that problem. Um, I work a lot with schools as well, doing basic general uh, education about insects and um, collecting and things like that. And um, it's it's different day to day. Big projects. We're actually uh, we just got a grant to do some invasive species outreach and education at the border. So we're going to be doing um, putting together some outreach material, and then we're also going to be doing some online e-learning for first detector training, if anyone's interested in first detector training. So we're going to be doing some e-learning stuff through um, through UAF up in Fairbanks of so, things. Snapshot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how does one become an entomologist? That's a great question. Uh, so there's, there's several routes. Um, there's the, you know, go to school, get a degree route, but I think anyone who has a general interest in insects and who wants to go out and look for them or learn more about them, I think should consider themselves an entomologist if you're interested in it and you want to learn more and you, you know, have that desire, that's how you become an entomologist. Yeah. 
Anything else?